This is Michigan Magazine with Del Vaughn and Barry Stutzman. you can join us for another edition of Michigan Magazine. I'm Barry Stutzman. Michigan Magazine, of course, is the program dedicated to the people and places of our fine state. And we rely heavily on you, the viewers, comments and suggestions for future shows. Right. If you have any suggestions, comments, or whatever it might be, there will be an address at the end of the program. Be sure to drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. We've got plenty of places we're going to be visiting today, so let's get right into it. On this edition of Michigan Magazine, we head for Sault Ste. Marie for a guided tour of the Valley Camp, a 550-foot freighter that's been renovated into a museum ship. We visit with Executive Director Kevin Markin. Then it's over to Whitefish Point, where we talk with Richard Monesto about the shipwrecks of Lake Superior and a tour of the historical museum there. You'll see actual artifacts taken from the depths of our Great Lakes. Then it's down to Reed City, the home of Reverend George Bernard, author of the gospel classic, The Old Rugged Cross. We visit with Colin Hayward at the Old Rugged Cross Museum. He tells us how the Reverend was inspired to write one of the greatest gospel classics. Then it's back into the Upper Peninsula and a stop at Eagle Harbor and an historical operating lighthouse. We talk with lighthouse keepers Ruth and Bill about bygone days at the lighthouse. All this coming up next on this edition of Michigan Magazine. Hi and welcome to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. We're here at the Valley Camp Museum. It's a 550 foot freighter and we're here on the St. Mary's River. The Valley Camp is a 1917 steam-powered vessel with the largest Great Lakes Maritime Museum within it. Kevin Markin, Executive Director of the museum, explained to us we could walk the top or the bottom deck. So we started at the bottom, with him telling us about some of the artifacts of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which are the only major artifacts ever recovered from the tragic shipwreck. The only, only two uh, lifeboats, uh, the full-size meter-type lifeboats uh, that, they, that they did have aboard. There's some lubber, rubber uh, life, life rafts that were torn up during the, during the, uh, the storm. I think. But these are the only two uh, lifeboats. And how did you happen to acquire these lifeboats? Uh, you've got two here. You've got the other one in the what uh, part of the ship here? Right in the memorial, we've got this is the exhibit area of the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, uh, memorial and exhibit, and we've also got a memorial area dedicated to the crew that contains the, the other lifeboat. Oh, okay. But they were uh, acquired from uh, uh, Ogilvy Norton and their Columbia Transport Division, the shipping company that uh, uh, the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald uh, sailed for. They were the ones that owned the, the, uh, the lifeboat, and uh, uh, they uh, thought it would be good to have a memorial to the, to the crew uh, that uh, sailed the border. And, oh, yeah. Right. They donated to us for that purpose. And I see that uh, up there on the top deck is this Great Lakes Marine Hall of Fame. What is that? Two historic sites uh, uh, has uh, held uh, the uh, uh, Great Lakes uh, Hall of Fame uh, banquets where they uh, select uh, in various years different individuals uh, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So it houses people, uh, both historical figures like uh, uh, Samuel Champlain and Jacques Cartier and other ones like that in Great Lakes history as well as more current ones. Um, people like George Steinbrenner who's uh, 
uh, has a shipping uh, company, uh, maybe one of the uh, better known of the more recent figures in mm -hmm. uh, current uh, sort of making Great Lakes history uh, uh -huh. uh, right now they've been inducted. Oh. They also though um, cover all aspects of uh, Great Lakes Maritime history that we, that we can. Uh, we show the development of Great Lakes freighters throughout the history from days of the sail through uh, steam transportation mm -hmm. and the design changes in the Great Lakes freighter. We also talk about aids to navigation, how the, the uh, navigational buoys and lights uh, work. People are usually very fascinated with that. Also we have um, four 1,400-gallon uh, fish aquarium that shows various uh, Great Lakes fish species and uh, we have a Great Lakes fish tug and other things like that interpreting the uh, fishing industry. So we try to try to cover uh, as many of the bases as we can. We've got a, a very uh, large uh, facility but it also covers a, quite a few bases. Besides housing the museum, the ship is history itself as evident in the preservation of the captains and crew's quarters. They are kept exactly as they were when the Valley Camp sailed the Great Lakes. To maintain the Valley Camp is an enormous task. But it does have an uh, excellent crew of uh, staff and uh, volunteers as well as uh, Collins and others that come in to give us a hand to try to uh, take good care of the artifacts, exhibit them well, and uh, develop a museum facility that uh, we we'll all be proud of and that the uh, public can uh, find very enjoyable and also very educational. It's a nonprofit historical society that maintains the Valley Camp along with the Tower of History and the historic home area. Thanks to Kevin Markin and the great job he and his staff are doing in preserving Michigan's maritime history and encourage people of our state while visiting the oldest city, Sault Ste. Marie, to be sure and visit the Valley Camp. Michigan, the water wonderland. Nowhere is it more evident than in the Great Lakes that surround both peninsulas. The seemingly serene beauty has inspired many a poet and a songwriter. Inspiring and beautiful as they may be, those truly familiar with the Great Lakes will hasten to remind you of the fury those serene waters can and have unleashed. Unexpected storms of the Great Lakes have claimed numerous lives and ships. Among the casualties on the greatest of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, have been the Alberta and the John Osborne, the Invincible, the Comet, and the most famous of them all, the Edmund Fitzgerald. Michigan Magazine was intrigued by the many shipwrecks of Lake Superior, so we headed to Whitefish Point, the home of an impressive maritime shipwreck museum owned and operated by the Great Lakes Shipwreck Society, where we talked with Richard Monesto, one of the founding fathers of the society, and a certified diver, who's actually visited shipwrecks on Lake Superior's bottom, including the Edmund Fitzgerald. Richard explained to us what they had discovered while videoing their last expedition to the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yes, in the video we saw that there was a big brass bell sitting on the mast, and uh, next year's expedition would like to go out and salvage the bell and return it here and have a memorial for sailors lost on the Fitzgerald and all other sailors lost on the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. This lake, Lake Superior in Whitefish Bay area, has very treacherous waters. I understand or there wouldn't be any Great Lakes freighter disasters. Uh, any idea why the, the lakes are so treacherous out there? It well, just, it's a big lake and yeah. then uh, just about like an ocean out there. Mm -hmm. And the winds get you hauling, they're going 90 miles an hour. The November winds are very notorious, I understand. Yeah, they come up and they blow hard and the waves get pretty big. You get a 35 foot wave mm -hmm. and then freighters, uh, they seem to bend in the middle. On the day that we visited Whitefish Point, Lake Superior's waters seemed serene and tranquil. It was hard to comprehend that a mere 17 miles from where Richard and I stood on a November night in 1975, the Great Lake swallowed the Fitzgerald and its 29 crew members without the slightest sign of remorse, leaving them to rest 538 feet below the surface. The unpredictability of Lake Superior is awesome. The Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Museum is located on Lake Superior at the very end of Whitefish Road off of M123, north of Paradise in the Upper Peninsula. A visit here will leave you with a newfound respect for our Great Lakes. 
Walk through the doors of the museum and you're greeted by the enormous lens from the White Shoal Lighthouse. And the guardian of the display is the carved wooden eagle from the steamer Vienna, which sank in heavy seas in 1892. From this point, you'll see around you actual artifacts that have been salvaged from the Great Lakes bottom in past diving expeditions. In our tour, Richard shared with us a dive that he had made to the comet, referred to as Lake Superior's treasure ship. We've dove the comet previously, and uh, we haven't filmed it all as of yet. We hope to include it in a documentary along with a Fitzgerald. It might be one by itself. Mm -hmm. We haven't decided. These are some artifacts. That spoon you see in there is, uh, has the name Comet written on it. It was the only artifact that we'd recovered with a name on it. Ooh. That bowl is full of silver ore over there. This is just a wash bowl and a picture, or maybe a fruit bowl off the galley. There's a lot of dishes and stuff on the bottom spewing around behind it. As of, uh, you'll see the arches are on it. It was also carrying 500 tons of pig iron on it. Uh, these cabins have been removed, and so it was more or less carrying cargo mm -hmm. and passengers. What position was it at the bottom there? I mean, was it uh, the bow has gone into the bank. It is upright, but the bow is probably buried up into the forward arch here. An intricate part of preserving the history of the shipwrecks of the Great Lakes is the salvage and diving operations, which is also covered in display at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Museum. Michigan's water wonderland that extends beneath the surface of Superior holds mysteries and thousands of relics of Michigan's past. A space and time that was rudely interrupted by the whim of the Great Lake. While traveling the Upper Peninsula, the museum is a must stop before you go any further along Great Lake shores. A stop here will undoubtedly place a new perspective on the way that one looks at the Great Lakes. Along with the limitless beauty comes a respect demanded by Lake Superior. Hi again and welcome to Reed City, a growing community. We're here today because of a famous songwriter who wrote a great gospel tune, a tune, Old Rugged Cross. The gentleman's name is Reverend George Bernard. We visited the Old Rugged Cross Historical Museum located just outside Reed City and talked with Colin Hayward about one of the most popular gospel tunes ever published. It was written over a period of several years, 1911 to 1912. Uh, he wrote the hymn and as he was writing the hymn it took time because there was a point, a point in time that he did not um, he couldn't come up with the right words. He had been studying the theme of the cross and its centrality to Christ, and he was trying to figure out what to do and how to do it, and it just didn't come to him. And he just stopped, and after a while came back and wrote the hymn, finished the hymn, and it was first performed in 1913 in the Pokagon Methodist Episcopal Church at Pokagon, Michigan. The inspiration was Galatians 6.14, and that goes, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I saw the cross, and the cross is inseparable. I not only saw the cross, of course, but also the Christ of the cross. That was Reverend Bernard's whole theme in writing the hymn, after he'd had the trouble with not coming up with the centrality of the cross and what it meant with Christ and, and so on. And that is what, finally, the biblical verse that came across that brought him to write the hymn. He was definitely called by the Lord to be an evangelist, he felt first, but he also had this gift that the Lord gave him to be a songwriter, a hymn writer. Uh, interesting that in about 1974, 75, uh, after all those years, he was inducted uh, into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. Oh. Now, I'm not a guitarist, so I don't know how to hold the instrument. But this was the, this was the uh, instrument that Reverend Bernard used when he composed the hymn. Already That's right. He did not play the piano. His wife, Hannah Dahlstrom Bernard, played the piano and she accompanied him. But he always uh, strummed his guitar and played the guitar and sang the hymns and wrote the hymns. And he was, wanted to be known as an evangelist, not a hymn writer, although he wrote over 300 hymns. 
Colin went on to tell us that by 1939, over 15 million copies of the hymn had been sold. Reverend Bernard died October the 10th, 1958, and his wife, the former Hannah Dolstrom, died on July 3rd, 1977. In her will, Mrs. Bernard left the artifacts of she and Reverend Bernard's life to the Reed City Area Chamber of Commerce. The hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, is a monument in gospel music. Lighthouses are a fascinating part of maritime history, and Michigan, with its hundreds of miles of coastline, has been blessed with dozens of them. In the early days, Great Lakes freighters relied solely on the manned beacons to guide the way through rough weather. But as time passed, the manned lighthouses gave way to automation and radar. No longer was it necessary for a human to keep a nightly vigil on the beacons. Michigan Magazine, in our travels through the Upper Peninsula, came upon an operating lighthouse in the Keweenaw Peninsula's Eagle Harbor. This lighthouse had also succumbed to automation, but through the efforts of an area historical society, everything has been preserved, as it was before the necessary changes were made. On the Wednesday we visited the lighthouse, Bill and Ruth Vincent were keepers of the lighthouse. Keepers not in the sense one would think to keep the beacon shining, the U.S. Coast Guard had that under control with automation, but keepers in the sense of keeping the past alive, giving tours of the lighthouse, living quarters, and adjacent fog house. Ruth told us everything at the Eagle Harbor Lighthouse is kept exactly as it may have looked at the turn of the century. The furniture is all typical of that time. If you ever had to sit on one of those hairs, horse hair filled uh, chairs or uh, sofas, you'd know it because you get kind of itchy. <laughs> to make lighthouse living attractive to potential keepers, living quarters had to be complete since lighthouses were usually in desolate locations. Lighthouses were rather isolated so they made it attractive for the light keepers to have their families with them. This was a real essential part that had to be filled and you had to attract them somehow. I always get a kick out of that uh, sign down there. The ladies spittoon? Yes. <laughs> well, they thought of everything. They had to. They wanted to keep good people here. <laughs> Lighthouse tours like the one given to us by Ruth and Bill are provided by members of the Keweenaw County Historical Society, which maintains the living quarters and museum. While upstairs, unaccessible to tourists, the automated light, owned and operated by the U.S. Coast Guard, still keeps a 24-hour vigil for passing freighters and ships. Also maintained by the Historical Society is the fog house that's adjacent to the lighthouse. Here on display are memorabilia, pictures, and artifacts of area shipwrecks and interesting facts of a time when copper was king. Lake Superior's bays and harbors presented expected and unexpected dangers to the seafaring industry. Besides lighthouses, buoys were used for reference and safety which in itself provided a danger when they had to be retrieved at the end of each shipping season, as Bill tells us. I've seen the time when there's a mound of ice right up over the light. You couldn't see the light on the buoy any longer. So you use, uh, use hot water to soften the ice, and then you chip it off with an axe. You notice that man has a lifeline attached to his waist. Because <laughs> when he's working down there, with one foot on the plank and one on the boy. If he slips, he's going to get a cold bath. Copper is what drew many a freighter to Keweenaw County. It is copper country, with some of the largest deposits found anywhere. And the Keweenaw County Historical Society has a special display building adjacent to the lighthouse with artifacts of the earliest copper miners. Who they were is still a mystery. Copper in Keweenaw County has been mined by man since prehistoric times. What is not commonly uh, known is that when the early prospectors came into this area where they found copper outcropping on the rocks, they found uh, places where uh, shallow pits where mining had been done before. And they assumed it was the Indians, but in questioning the Indians, they said no, it was some tribe of people that preceded them. They apparently came every spring and left in the fall, but they never left anything to indicate who they were or where they came from. The early copper miners of Keweenaw County. Who were they and where did they come from? Perhaps we'll find out on a future edition of Michigan Magazine. For more information on the Eagle Harbor Lighthouse or Keweenaw County, you can contact the Keweenaw County Historical Society in Eagle Harbor.
Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this week's Michigan Magazine. And a special thanks to Kevin Markin of the Valley Camp at Sault Ste. Marie, also Colin Hayward of the Old Rugged Cross Historical Society in Reed City. And thanks to Richard Modesto for joining us from Whitefish Point. And of course, who could forget Ruth and Bill, the lighthouse keepers at Eagle Harbor, Michigan. You know, we rely heavily on your comments and suggestions for future topics on Michigan right. Magazine, and we'd love to hear from you. If you've got any suggestions or ideas, please drop us a line. The address is Michigan Magazine, P.O. Box 503, Rose City, Michigan, 48654. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, and we'd love to see you again on our next edition of Michigan Magazine. On our next edition, we'll travel to Midland and visit with Bobby Randall of the high-energy country western group Sawyer Brown. We'll also talk with Bobby's parents, Bob Sr. and Clyde Randall, about their reaction to Bobby's musical success. And I'll be visiting with Stan Bozich of Frankenmuth, Michigan, creator of Michigan's own military and space museum, where he will give us a guided tour of the museum and show us some of Michigan's Medal of Honor recipients and also who were the polar bears. That's coming up on our next edition of Michigan Magazine.